Hi everyone, this is George. Welcome to this unique conversation. I'm here with Peter Rubin and Tom Buford. Uh, and actually, the guy who brought us together was Peter uh, in terms of this project. Uh, he had this idea of what if we put together a, um, just we collaborate on a resource that, that gave our opinion on all the different marketing methods out there that could serve our, that could be useful for our clients and our audience. And so Peter started the spreadsheet that you're going to, you're going to uh, see on the screen soon. And, um, and then uh, Tom and I went in and added some of our own ideas in there and then we scored it. Uh, our scores may differ, diff giving, giving our own experiences with what's worked for our clients, ourselves, as well as our audience. So um, just take it, uh, take it, take it uh, how you want it. And then there's a total score column. You'll see that adds us together so that hopefully we're going to start talking about the uh, marketing methods that we s collectively scored the highest first. And, uh, but let me actually allow Peter, Tom, you guys to introduce yourselves. Uh, just for, for who I am, I have been in the marketing coaching industry for, for seven years. And my focus these days has been to create a lot of content, uh, share it on social media, and what I particularly like to, uh, how I differentiate myself with a lot of my previous peers, <laughs> these, not, not these guys on the line, but my previous peers, I would say I'm, I like to focus on authenticity in marketing, having integrity, and really serving people, uh, doing really right by, by our conscience and by the, the people we're serving in our audience. So anyway, that's a bit about me. Um, Peter, can I turn it over to you? Yeah, thank you, George. Um, I guess first I'll share that this idea came to me because many of my clients are confused about what marketing methods to do. And it's really understandable. There are so many different options. I think we came up with 35 or so different marketing methods. And even if you're in the industry and you're a business coach, um, it's a lot to keep track of. And I wanted to put some brilliant minds together and, and have a recommendation because I, I find that my clients do best when they pick one, maybe two methods and stick with it. Um, rather than chase after the next new periscope. So, <laughs> so that's why I wanted to do this and who I am. I'm a business coach. I help visionaries give birth to their business. Um, my partner is a midwife. So I think of myself as a business midwife, helping mm -hmm. with that messy early stage of taking your ideas and then realizing them in the world. And marketing is a huge part of it because without marketing, no one knows what you're doing. So um, i nice. looking forward to this. and. And it's Tom. Yeah, so my name's uh, Tom Buford, and uh, I met George, well, about uh, how long ago, George? Yeah, five, five, years. five years ago, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so I've been doing, uh, doing online marketing about the same amount of time. I started in uh, 2007, actually following up a, a bankruptcy. So I had a, a painting business way back when doing automotive paint repair, did well with that, but had health concerns, got out of that, went into real estate, uh, started doing real estate in 2004, five, six really bad time. If you look back, uh, as history tells us, so hindsight's 2020 and, um, got out of that and realized, you know, I've made some mistakes, but I've had a lot of experiences that I can share. So I started getting into business coaching and started developing products and one thing led to the other. And, and then I, I started really getting into the online marketing and, uh, George and I found, uh, ourselves collaborating on some referral partnerships, promotional partnerships, and both kind of took a step back. Uh, I think you did before I did. But that's uh, something we realized, uh, kind of the way the industry was going. So it's one of the reasons you and I connected through this is just having pretty candid conversations about uh, what's working, what, you know, a lot of things work that maybe we shouldn't be doing. And, yeah. uh, but there are plenty of things that we can do out there that, that are uh, still keeping our clients in mind first. So, yeah. so I'm really that's appreciative awesome. of part of this conversation. And, and I would say that what works um, in the short term doesn't always work in the long term. Right. And what works in the long term sometimes doesn't work in the short term. Mm -hmm. And so um, what's interesting, I mean, Tom, you and I, uh, we've, we've seen uh, probably a number of our joint venture partners, their businesses kind of go away mm -hmm. um, because maybe they were using some of those short-term tactics that uh, was, was not um, as within as much integrity as, as it could have been. And people, eventually find people always find out eventually yeah you know? and so yeah. all right um without further ado let me just share the screen uh 
And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let me make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Uh, and um, you know what, Peter, can I have you intro this or however you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what we've created here is, let me see, I can't scroll on it. Right. That's oh, uh, yeah, you know what? Um, let me give you access to scrolling here. Um, well, you, there you go. Do that. Now, now, now you have it. Oh, very cool. Um, so really simply, this is a list of marketing methods that we created collaboratively. And we distilled a lot of information into very pithy descriptions of what the method is, what category it's in, and a brief description about what it is and why you might want to use it. And as George mentioned, we each gave it a score from one to five. Five being this is one of our top recommendations for clients. And one being we don't recommend it um, for whatever reason. So what I was thinking we'd do is just go down the list, spend about a minute or two on each one, and give just like the most Cliff Notes version of the marketing method and, and our thoughts on it. Um, some of these we could spend, you know, a week teaching, right? So we're just going to give you a little pointer. And the idea is that if you feel some resonance with it, um, you can check out our websites or do a Google search and learn more about it um, yeah. and how you, might, how you might actually implement it for your business. Awesome. Sounds good. Cool. Um, well, let's just grab the ahead. ones that are speaking to us. Maybe, maybe the person who added it, or someone who rated it highly could talk about it. Okay, so I, I added this online networking one. Um, I'm, I'm not even going to say which ones I add. I'll just kind of jump in here. Uh, the, 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 the reason I added this is because that's, there was a, there's another line later, which you'll see, which is networking. And networking typically is thought of as, and this is actually important to, to address, networking uh, is typically thought of as in person. You go to a meetup event. You go to conferences. Uh, maybe you go to association meetings, trade shows, that kind of thing, uh, and more, or even just parties you go to and you kind of meet people. Um, I have, I've never been good at that personally. Maybe that's why I, rank, I rated online networking higher. Uh, I've always been kind of stuck with one person <laughs> in a party. <laughs> I can't get away from them because I'm just too nice and I don't want to like make the conversation. And so I get stuck. I'm not great. I'm not going uh, personal networking uh, in person. So online networking works well for me because I get to uh, choose who I want to message. I don't have to feel like I have to be right there and I, we can have a basically like an email conversation or a Facebook messaging conversation. And there are so many ways of doing it, but uh, basically it's reaching out to, to me, the way I think about it, it's reaching out to kindred spirits who, it doesn't matter, they could be become a potential client or a client, they could be a, a, a colleague a referral partner or simply a new friend and someone to encourage one another. And so that's how I think of online networking. Great. Any, uh, anything else to add? Yeah. To you guys, one thing I'll add is that we'll, we'll talk about Facebook groups later on. Yeah. But when you keep it in the Facebook group, it's hard to develop a real connection with someone. You know, you right. could be messaging with them for months and not really get a sense of them. So what I love to do yeah. is invite people to a virtual tea where I have an nice. online scheduler and say, you know, click here and let's talk for half an hour. And right. I'll do that if I feel resonance with someone online. And if you do one of those, you know, one of those a week, you have 52 new connections over a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. One thing too, that I would consider this right here, one version of online networking. So it can look a lot of different ways. And, and mm -hmm. four days ago, uh, Peter and I hadn't been introduced and George put this together or well, they put this together initially through Peter and then George, uh, asked me to to join along. So, you know, it's a great way for Peter and I to connect and, and develop our own relationship too moving forward. So it, it doesn't have to be just to a client or a potential client or referral partner or someone like that. It can just be someone you can collaborate on ideas in your business. And it really helps if you're stuck behind a computer all day doing this so that you're getting uh, with people who understand what you do. If you're a coach, you probably explain, your, your spouse probably still doesn't know what you do. So it, it's a great <laughs> people to get it. Yeah. And of course we can, thank you for that. And, and we can take online networking offline as well. I've met some people after years of messaging with them online, we finally meet in person and it mm -hmm. feels like an old friend. Yeah. Um, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, 
Hey, Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this, have, have you start on this. Okay. Yeah, so email newsletters, uh, as anyone watching this, you, you probably get inundated with your newsletters uh, okay. and may think you don't want to do your own. Uh, but I think it's, you know, curating it down to the ones that are most important to you because there's a lot of great information being shared through newsletters, um, a lot of BS too. But, you know, you filter through it and you, you get down to the ones that you want to read. But for you as the, uh, the thought leader, the business owner, it's really important to stay in touch with people. And yeah. uh, an email is one of the easiest ways to do that. Even people that teach social media marketing are telling you to get people off of social media and onto an email list because if Facebook disappears tomorrow, which it won't, but um, you know, you can't connect with those people anymore. So you're relying on, on these other uh, networks. So when you're building relationship with people, you get people that are interested and you can continue to build uh, to deliver value. And that's the, the critical part is don't just pitch people. Um, you know, deliver value, build a relationship. Statistics show that people need to get uh, between seven and nine uh, high value, low risk touches from you before they're you know, going to commit. Some people will commit sooner. Some people never will. But it really is a good way for you to do that. It's also easy to share. So, and it keeps you focused on, you know, I think creating content on a regular basis and getting it out there to your newsletter list. So I think that's one of the keys too. Yeah, right on. Peter, you want to say anything about it? Yeah. I'll actually, um, George, something I like about your newsletter is that you don't take a lot of time writing it. You just yeah. have you know, links to your blog articles. Right. Um, and one thing I do is that they always say to do email newsletters consistently. And for me, it's just not a top priority for my business. So I've given myself permission to write an email when I have something to say. Yeah. And for me, just treating it like any other relationship, you know, and, and reaching out when I feel inspired, I have something to celebrate or something to teach. To me, that feels more aligned with my energy and it makes it go from, you know, marketing chore to something really authentic. I like um, it. It's I just sent one out today celebrating three big things that happened. Right. Awesome. So I don't, you know, I don't sell very much at all. Just a way to, to reach out and to connect. Great idea. Yeah, great idea. Um, one thing I'll add about email newsletters is the, stati- the analytics that come with it. So with... Um, uh, with, you know, you're able to see uh, how many opens you get for an email. Even, I mean, I use MailChimp. And so you can even see who clicked on, 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 on the links. Uh, and you can even see who opened it the most. And one, one idea that I haven't even, uh, done, but I think I will, is to reach out to the people who um, opened uh, my emails the most, right? And that's, that's one idea to, to say, oh, these are my fans. These are, these are people I want to build more, more of a relationship with. So um, next one, uh, Peter, do you want to? Stay? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Speaking is, if I were to pick one, you know, to give a, a score of six, it would be speaking. Yeah. So the way I think about it is that there are two factors to look at in our marketing. One is volume, how many people we reach at once. And two is intimacy. So how deeply can we touch someone? And speaking does both, right? Because it's, it's not a one-to-one thing. It's a one-to-many thing. We're in front of a room of you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 people. Um, and when you're in person with a room, they just get such a good sense of who you are. Um, so I love speaking. In 2014, speaking was my, my only marketing method. I didn't even have a website. I had literally a one-page website with a newsletter sign up. And I had a waiting list coaching practice by speaking twice a month. Wow. Um, great. Some of those were my own meetup. Some of them were through partnerships with mm. educational organizations. Mm. Um, so what I'll say about speaking is whenever a gig comes my way and, and the audience is aligned, if, if the audience is aligned with who I want to serve, um, I say yes to it. Mm. There's another way of using speaking where you're actually going out searching for gigs um, you know, reaching out and that's more, that's more involved. It's not something I do personally. Um, but that's another, a whole nother skill set is how do you find those speaking arrangements? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, uh, Peter, how have you been able to get people to attend your in- in-person events? So the, you know, I said the main thing I do is I speak at other people's venues Mm-hmm. So, so usually, you know, I'll put a, a post on Facebook, I'll write my newsletter, you know, maybe I'll get a third of the people to show up, but two thirds of the audience is from someone else's community or their, you know, their newsletter. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I'll also say about content is um, speaking is not as hard as it seems. You know, people say it's your number one, you know, it's the number one human fear. 
yeah. you know, somewhere up there near death. Right. Um, yeah. But I think of it as teaching more than speaking. Yeah. You know, I go up there, I have, you know, three or four things I want to teach. Um, and I just share it, I share it freely and I have exercises and I have it be interactive. Um, so I've, and, and I help my clients speak in a way that's authentic to them. Yeah. Some of them are more like motivational speakers. Others are more facilitators. Yeah. Um, different people have their own flavor of it. Mm, awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess what I want to add is uh, I, I totally agree with you that speaking, I would say, is probably on this whole list the number one way to gain new clients. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reason why I, I ranked it a four instead of a five <laughs> is uh, I'm a contrarian. No, um, it's because uh, I, I, I find it uh, very time, uh, time and energy intensive for me. Uh, to do speaking, even though I love it. I so love being on stage. Um, and also I find it challenging to, well, it's, it, it's, I probably need to spend more effort and time doing this, but I find it challenging to actually get speaking gigs. So, you know, I, I end up doing like two or three a year, just, just not even reaching out and people reaching out to me and, and inviting me. But, but in terms of getting a, something regular going, uh, Peter, I really admire that you've, you've been able to do that. Yeah. Tom, any, anything you want to add on this? Yeah, I mean, I would have to say I agree 100%. If you have to give one of these a six, speaking is probably it because it's, um, as he said, he filled his practice by doing one thing without having a fancy website. And it, it can be fearful to do it, but if you just share great information and just share something from your heart, gives, you know, three, four tips that people can take away. You don't, you don't have to be a fancy speaker. You don't have to be the most eloquent person in the world. Just share good information that's going to be valuable and, and, uh, it's, I've done some speaking in the past. It's fallen my way, and I'm really looking to add that as uh, one of my main, probably my main, I mean, honestly, the, the number one thing that I do moving forward because it has been uh, fun and definitely effective because you do yeah. connect with people. Uh, I can think of the few times I've spoken, even starting, gosh, I think seven years back when I did my first speaking gig, and I still have people that I know are connected with me on my newsletter um, mm. and, and clients in the past purchased products from from a couple of these gigs. So yeah, definitely effective. Awesome. Good. And there's a lot of training out there on how to, how to do it. You know, there's a book that I'm reading called the message of you. So it's, you know, even if you're just getting started, she, you know, Judy Carter has a lot of great tips on how to get started and finding gigs just to get out there. Great. That's a great resource. Thank you. Yeah. Peter, uh, you put this on there. Yeah. Um, it's ironic because I don't even have a Yelp account, but I put it as a five. <laughs> yeah well so what, what's the reason you did um the reason i put it up there is like like google business which we'll talk about it's it takes a few steps to get your your yelp page up um you can ask your clients who are already writing testimonials to post them as reviews on yelp yeah and i've just heard a lot of people getting a lot of business through yelp mm. you know it's a place people are going to search for you know coaches consultants any sort of local service People are already on there and it's really easy. Mm. Uh, I know Yelp does paid advertising as well. Being a promoted business, they yeah. can make a video for you. And I have not heard very positive things about the value of that service. Right. But just having the free account um, seems really easy. Yeah, cool. Um, the re uh, Tom, you want to jump in first? No, I, I think uh, one of the things too is people, um, they distrust advertising, but they trust someone else's, even a stranger's opinion. So uh, depending on the survey, the research you see, uh, something in the number of 86% of people will trust uh, a review from someone else, a perfect stranger. Yeah. So it, if you have a local business, uh, I think it's important. To get, you've got to be looking at reviews and Yelp is one and then also the Google reviews. So, and especially if you can get at least uh, five Google reviews and no one else is doing it, that gives you the star, the visual star rating. In, mm. in the app. So that, that's important too for, for local business. Nice, nice. Yeah. So uh, once again, <laughs> I'm the sort of the center on, on in this on this panel. Um, so I, I I think probably the reason is because a lot of most of my clients are virtual, mm -hmm. and a lot of them live in places where Yelp is there's there's no Yelp community really, and so Yelp is typically I mean rarely does someone go on Yelp and search for a resource outside of their own city, right? So it's almost it's almost I think. Um, we all three of us live in major metro areas in the United States where Yelp is very active. So we're lucky that we could use Yelp. And Peter, you're right. I should probably just start a Yelp account. 
the 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 other thing that my other hesitation about Yelp though is when I had looked into it, uh, um, just like on Amazon reviews, like we're we're not supposed to act, actually Yelp is supposed to be even more strict. We're not supposed to ask people to write us nice reviews. Um, the only thing we're supposed to do is to put a sticker on our on our on our door that says you know find us on Yelp or people love us on Yelp or something like that. So the the technical terms of service makes it you know just supposedly discourage it and and the other thing is when i look at someone with all five yelp star yelp reviews i get really i get really suspicious like oh this is probably just all their friends and family you know or other clans but yeah it, it, it's it's I, I agree with you that i have heard of some people getting business from there and it definitely is worth uh worth looking into the, the one thing i'll add that i forgot to say is that the reason most people when people have resistance to it i think the biggest fear is that they'll get a bad review mm-hmm um, and I've had this happen to a client. She's a therapist and had a, um, oh, you know, yeah. there's some question, you know, questionable mental health of this client. Oh, and she yeah, wrote yeah. a scathing one star review. Oh, geez. And it ended up being a really big ordeal. She wasn't able to take it down. Um, right. So there's something very vulnerable about putting yourself out there for reviews Absolutely. that you're not under your control. So it's that paradox of, you know, wanting a world where there's more accountability. Yes. Um, and, you know, yeah. sometimes people, you know, take out their stuff on you. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and the thing is, uh, if you have a Yelp profile and if you have, you know, more than a couple of reviews, when people Google your name, it's almost certainly your Yelp profile will show up in the top, probably top five results. So it's easy for people to see what your reviews are. Um, on a similar topic, Facebook fan pages have reviews as well. And also mm-hmm. you cannot take off any negative reviews from your Facebook fan page. I don't know if people knew that, but I, I have a couple of people on my Facebook fan page who gave me four stars out of five stars and none of the four star people have ever used my service. So it just kind of like, Oh, I kind of like George. I'll give him four out of five. <laughs> it's like, Oh, well, okay. All my clients give me five stars. Why give me four stars? You know? So yeah, it's, it's like for people like me who are very, uh, I guess, um, you know, perfectionistic about our reviews that, that can, that can be, harmful as well but, but yeah anyway take it as as you like and uh let's go on to guest blogging um i'll, I'll jump in on this one uh, you know blogging people always say oh you got to start a blog but the problem with starting your own blog is that it's very challenging to get traffic to your blog mm-hmm. you start writing 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 and you wonder if anyone else is reading it at all um the the, 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 the best way, one of the best ways to get traffic to your own website, to your own blog, is by writing articles for other people's blogs. Because other people who have already built up an audience, you show up there, uh, the fact if, if you get accepted to write there, uh, it's, it's an endorsement from that website. And I'll, I'll, that's one benefit. The other benefit, of course, is that the fact that there's an audience there. The third benefit is that in your guest blog post, you can include links back to your own articles or, of course, your own website. And that link, it's called link building. Google finds it incredibly important that other people, other websites are linking back to yours. And so that's why I I like this uh, method a lot. Um, uh, Peter? I I agree. I think um, I rated normal blogging pretty low because no one's going to see it. Um, unless you put in a lot of time and energy building your community, but guest blogging, I have a friend who is a sexuality coach and she developed a relationship with elephant journal, which posts a lot of articles on sexuality. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden she was getting, I don't know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people viewing her articles and wow. a small fraction would come to her website. But even that small fraction was a whole lot of people right. and that right. single handedly made her business. Wow. So, so Again, like, like speaking or teaching, having those partnerships that enable you to consistently send articles to the same, same channel, um, that's the key to have it be really effective. Mm. And Tom is uh, the dissenter here. I'm being contrary on this one a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, I think guest blogging can be great. I've not done enough of it for me to, uh, to really say. I've done some guest blogging. I've seen some mixed results. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you, you absolutely have to be a really good writer uh, because you've got to, if you want to do guest blogging, in my opinion, you've got to approach some big sites that have a lot of traffic right. that are not only, you'll notice some guest blog posts. If you go into some big blogs, you'll see the person that owns and runs the blog. If they're doing still quite a bit of writing, they're the ones getting the comments and reviews or, you know, the comments, the, 
the guest blogs aren't necessarily getting as many comments. Uh, oh. Some blogs do a better job about really highlighting their guests. And that, that's good. So if you find the right ones, and I've known people that have done really well guest blogging, so it can be effective. Sure. But if you're not a good writer and you can't find the, the, uh, the sites, you're going to have, I think it's going to be a real struggle. However, you can get people to help you write. Uh, it can be your idea. You can have someone do some writing for you. You can record your ideas and, and get a copywriter. Uh, pretty easy to find some really good writers that can help get your, you know, your words out. So definitely ways of doing it to approach it. But I gave it a three just because of the... Uh, there's some other variables in there depending on what people are getting into. So. And I think it's, it's, it is challenging to find, uh, it, it takes the willingness to reach out to a lot of guests, a lot of blogs and hearing back from only a few. Uh, and, and so for some people that's really hard to, to take. Yeah. Yeah. But like Peter's client, it, it certainly paid off. So, I mean, that's, yeah. and that's all she needs to do. Probably. Yeah. So. I would, I would only recommend it if you're a dedicated writer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. If, if you're a writer, this is, the most effective way yes. you know, in yeah. my mind to, to do it. Yeah, awesome. All right, Facebook. Um, well, gosh, all of us know, know uh, what, what this means. I mean, there's so many tools involved in Facebook itself. Uh, we actually separate our Facebook groups as a separate line. But mm -hmm. uh, what, what can I say about this? I'll, I'll just say that um, if there was only one social network website that I recommend for anyone who's saying, well, which one should I use? It would be Facebook versus Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, all, all these. Facebook is the one. Uh, so the thing I would say that the reason I gave it a four is because I've seen a lot of my clients struggle with um, feeling like they have to check in a lot. A lot of my clients are introverts, and so they, they, are, they, they struggle with knowing how to use it uh, in an effective way. I'm a little bit introverted, but I don't mind it at all. Um, but let me turn it over to you guys. Um, Peter, what's, what's yeah, your Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Facebook, and I'm a convert. I used to hate it and not know why everyone <laughs> spent so much time on it yeah. until I realized how to do it my way. Um, yeah. You know, George talked about short versus long-term marketing. And yeah. I think Facebook mostly is long-term marketing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an incredibly effective tool for being visible to a lot of people in an yeah. ongoing way. Right. I, I actually prefer it to a mailing list. Um, huh. I, I use a service called Unroll Me because yeah. I get too many emails and it puts them all together in a clump. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think for reaching out to my people, I'd rather post on Facebook every day I'll post something inspiring. I'll post something personal and vulnerable. I'll share a lesson. Yeah. Um, and it's a consistent way. I, I posted a video celebrating my first $10,000 a month. I bought everyone ice cream at my local ice cream shop. Wow. And I got three and, you know, three and a half thousand views, three, you know, over 3000 views on this silly little video that, that my friend took of me. Yeah. Um, so Facebook, it, it's where everyone is. Um, you know, I use my own personal timeline. Facebook pages, as far as I can tell, are pretty useless since the algorithms changed a while back. Yeah. Um, I also like Facebook events a lot for either live in-person events or things like teleclasses. Um, you can invite up to 500 friends for free. Um, and if you post on the wall every day, it goes in people's notifications. So yeah. you can get people to show up, you know, just by creating a Facebook event. Yeah. Um, and groups we'll talk about more, but I, I just right. find it a very, and, and there's live video. It sort of has everything on it. Yeah. It's easy to waste time, but if you're focused, right. um, and you can use an app like Hootsuite to schedule your posts. Right. So you can spend a day generating content and then schedule it out for the next week. Yeah. So there's a lot of good ways to use it. Nice. Um, uh, yeah, I have mixed feelings about Facebook. I used to spend a lot of time and, and have definitely had some, some positive, uh, effects from it. I think that you can spend a lot of time on Facebook and not get anything. So I, I've, uh, and I'm a little more guarded now that I have, I have kids. So, uh, in fact, if you saw me looking over to the side earlier, my two year old would decided to come in. So that apparently no one's watching him right now. So <laughs> household of people, but, um, so I don't post anything about my kids on Facebook anymore. There's just too much vulnerability there, but I, and I know we're talking about business, but sometimes people have a hard time separating the two out. Yeah. Um, but it can be, there's a lot of great tools. A lot of people, I mean, people are there. I will say this though, if you're business to consumer, business to entrepreneur, uh, Facebook is the place. If you're business to business, uh, I, I firmly uh, endorse LinkedIn at yeah. least now, you know, we'll what Microsoft does with them, but, um, that, that's a fantastic place to be for business to business. And I think it's the best place to be for your business to business. 
Mm. So, and business to larger, you know, like small to mid-sized businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. Teleclasses. Um, well, I'll just say real quick that uh, I have done probably hundreds by this point of teleclasses mm -hmm. and I, I, I really like it. Um, but my preference these days is webinars whenever possible. Uh, the reason is because webinars are, are where people are usually at the computer or on their, you know, they're more, they're more, they're more focused and they're able to click through the things that, that we recommend and, and chat and things like that. So I really like the chatting feature, but teleclasses are powerful to reach a lot of people uh, and you don't have to feel like you're, you're, you have to dress up and, and look great because you're just speaking to a phone and you can reach a lot of people that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 oh, I cut my teeth on webinars. I mean, on tele, teleclasses, sorry. Yeah. And uh, only went into webinars when I, I decided to learn the technology and, and wanted to add visuals. But I think if somebody's getting started and they're really not comfortable with technology, but they do want to leverage uh, a message to do some teaching, I, I believe firmly in, uh, uh, educational marketing yeah, teleclasses are a great place to start low technology or lower technology um, people don't so that the advantage of having someone there being more engaged at, at a computer is true but then also the advantage of someone not having to beat their computer uh, can work well so someone can be driving and still at least listen maybe they're not as tuned in uh, because they're distracted but they, they can still pick up on the on what you're doing so I think teleclasses are great Good. Yeah, I want to second all that. Everything I said about speaking applies. It's just mm -hmm. like speaking online. Yeah. Um, the other benefits are that, first of all, you can have your outline in front of you. If you're not on video, you can, you know, you don't have to memorize anything. You can literally just, I don't like it when you, you can tell that someone's reading a script. Right. But to have an outline can be a good, you know, a good crutch if you're just getting started. Good point. Yeah. Um, good point. And the other thought is that teleclasses are, you know, they're, you can record them and then give them away as, mm -hmm you know, a free giveaway or, or whatever it is, it, it's saved for posterity. Yeah. So there's something really nice about that. Nice. And in Zoom, you know, what we're doing here, a Zoom recording, um, I don't know if you call it a teleclass or a webinar, somewhere in the middle, but I've been doing those recently. Yeah. I'm inviting people to join a Zoom room live and you can have the gallery of everyone's face. Mm -hmm. And it's really sweet if you're trying to create something more community oriented. Yeah. Doing a Zoom meeting is really nice. Yeah. Um, Teleclasses are also good if you're doing a subject that's a little bit more taboo. Um, if it's about sexuality or if it's about, who knows, something around money. Um, sometimes it's easier for people to say yes to a teleclass where they can be a bit anonymous mm -hmm. than show up live to a speaking gig or to have their face on a, on a screen somewhere. Yeah. Right, right. Good point. Yeah. Um, I also think that one, you know, another benefit, of course, teleclass is you can take the audio and just podcast it if you yeah. if you want to start a podcast yeah okay. you can transcribe and turn get articles and everything yeah it's a lot of, a lot of great and you can repurpose any information you have too so that's good yeah um google business okay i i ranked it a two <laughs> because um i unfortunately i just feel like google doesn't really do anything that well <laughs> unfortunately except for their email their email is great and search is search is decent but uh, I feel like I've, I've seen so many businesses on Google business, Google local, um, and they haven't really gotten much results on it. But, uh, but, I, but I do know, but I, I, can, I can see that that can be very effective for, like Tom said, the visual aspect of the five stars or whatever. But uh, let, me, let me go to you guys. Um, maybe Peter, what, what do you think? Nothing much to add. Just like Yelp, it's so easy to do. Why not? Mm -hmm. right. But I wouldn't, it's not a big strategy. It's just something you might as well do. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll rate it. One of the things I do too is I'm, I do marketing for local businesses. And if you're a local business and you're not doing this, um, it, it's a huge, huge mistake. It's the mm -hmm. number one thing. Uh, I call it local, local boost. Uh, if I'm working with a client, the first thing I'm going to do is, is go in and optimize. And it, it, the key is optimizing the Google uh, places page, which that used to be places, now it's business, but it's, um, there's something called NAP in AP. It's name, address, and, and uh, phone number. And you have to be consistent across all your, uh, your directories and everything. But if you're doing any local business, any advertising, just know the address you're always going to use. I mean, every, every letter, you, your phone number and your name just listed exactly the same. And you put it in different directories and the Google uh, business page. And you will, that's the fastest way to get seen on uh, for a local search. So between that and doing, uh, you know, making sure that you're getting some reviews, 
it's a real powerful way to get uh, to get seen for local business. Again, if you're coaching, you're working with people all over the world, I wouldn't spend any time doing this. Yeah. Uh, but if you're a local business and that's where you thrive, that's what you rely on. I, that's probably the first thing that it, for a client, that's the first thing I would do is make sure that their page is set up and, and uh, optimized. Yeah. Awesome. So. One-on-one, Peter, you want to start this? Yeah. One-on-one outreach. Um, I think this one is neglected because we're on this age of social media and mass emailing and mass communication, but right. in a way I think it makes it all the more powerful to reach out to someone, to someone who's referred to you or, you know, even calling a former client cause you have something new to offer. Yeah. And just to send in a personal email, give them a phone call or both and say, look, you know, I'm offering this new program. Here's what it is. I thought of you cause of what you, you know, what you're going through. Yeah. And here's what I think is possible for you. Would you like to have a longer conversation? Yeah. Um, there are different ways to do it. Um, yeah. I like an email so people can feel into it. Sometimes if I just give someone a call out of the blue, right. I don't want to put that pressure on them. But to give them an email, then call them two days later and, and check in. Um, you can do it. I think people are afraid of pressuring someone else or right. they won't be welcome. And just think of it as a really gentle invitation. Yeah. Um, this is how I started my coaching business. I'd actually go to coffee shops and I was so excited about being a coach, I'd strike up conversations with strangers, learn wow. about them, and offer them free sessions. <laughs> my, first, my first 10 clients were one-on-one like this. you got guts. Right? If it takes a little bit of guts. <laughs> and currently, I'll still do one-on-one outreach for my high-end programs. Um, you know, it's, there's sort of a, I don't know, exclusivity, but there, someone feels cared for if you say, look, I'm having a program, yeah. I'm designing, I'm looking for just the right people, and here's why you came to mind. Um, the other thing I'll say is you can either offer a free session or offer more of an exploratory consultation. Um, and I've done both. Right. It just depends on the relationship. Um, I'll chime in here on this. Uh, oh, and just a quick time check. Let's see if we can cover three more after this, and then we'll jump to the foundational ones. Sounds uh, good. So uh, one-on-one, absolutely second everything you say. Um, Peter, I, I would, I just, I'll just add with online one-on-one, it's possible as well. Or actually, as you've been talking about email, but uh, let me just say, for example, LinkedIn. Uh, people do not reach out one-on-one on LinkedIn enough in a thoughtful way. I've been on LinkedIn for, gosh, I guess ever since it started more than 10 years ago. And I have had so few people and I have like thousands of connections that I'm actually trying to remove. That's a whole other story. But I have had so few people reach out to me on LinkedIn or, yeah, on LinkedIn particularly in mm-hmm. a thoughtful way where they've looked at my website, they've looked at my profile, and, like, they're reaching out in a, in a truly win-win way that is relevant to me and not just some mass message. And uh, the few that have actually reached out to me in a thoughtful way, researched way, win-win, like, hey, I really believe this is good for you, your audience, and obviously me, um, I have – oftentimes created some kind of relationship there that's led to business uh, for one or the other person. And so people think just because it's online, social media, you can just blast messages and people respond. No, if we reach out one-to-one, you're almost certainly going to get better results than, than just trusting the mass messaging way. So uh, Tom, anything you want to add here? Yeah, I want to say that I was out of my mind. I've, I was filling this in quickly and I looked at two things that I've made errors on. The one-to-one outreach and the referrals, I inadvertently did threes. Um, I'll just say I would be at least a four or five on those. And so, and, and as you know, George, in our last conversation, I was talking about referrals. I think it's incredibly important. So, and it is something that's, that's, uh, that's skipped over. It's overlooked. And I agree hundred percent on LinkedIn. You get people, you get all these connections. Uh, I was actually surprised one time when somebody I was connecting with, they uh, messaged me and said, Hey, listen, in order for me to be a connection, I have to, I want to get on the phone and have a chat with you. And I was blown away. I thought that was, mm. that, that's how, how it should be done. Yet we're not doing it. It's all a numbers game and not, so it's, you know, quantity, not quality. And it yeah. should be reversed and you can get far more. I think this speaks a lot to, you know, Peter talking about speaking where it's more intimate and the one-on-one conversations can be intimate and maybe it's not as scalable, but I think again, we're too focused on scale and trying to get it out to as many people as possible rather than actually having a, a good connection. Cause you never know who you can talk to and who they can, you know, they can help you with things and, and make it a, about them as well. You know, how can you help them and yeah. start the conversation there? So awesome. Yeah. And, and since this is related, Tom, anything else you want to add on this referral part? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, especially if someone's just getting started, this might be one of the first things to, to do if you're a coach, uh, have some sort of a service that you're selling is to reach out and it could be through, you know, your social media uh, networks, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn, and just take somebody, invite someone out to coffee or invite someone to have a phone conversation and see how you can support each other in whatever, you know, venture you're working on. And, you know, that can turn into an invitation to speak somewhere or you never know where it's going to go. So you don't need an ulterior motive. You don't have to feel uncomfortable. You're not trying to sell anything. Uh, just connect. And then the referrals, um, you might even look at that as uh, invitations. So you yeah. might reach out to people, you know, individually and see if they want to get on board with you, you know, to join something else. In terms of referrals, it could just be, you know, hey, is there somebody that you can introduce me to? Um, and like to have a conversation so they feel uh, their guards lower a little bit when you're not using the term referral. Totally. totally. Yeah. And, and that's actually the reason why I gave, gave this one a three. I think it's probably just uh, the, the, the specific idea of asking current former client or former clients for introductions to more people mm -hmm. uh, feels um, yeah, feels uncomfortable to me. And I know to a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the reason why, but, but if we look at referrals as um uh, the way I would think about it is there are people out there who are struggling in ways that we specifically are good at relieving their pain or helping them reach a goal that they desperately want to reach. And if somebody in between us and that struggling person can connect the two of us, everybody truly wins. Yeah. And so if we, if, if we frame it in that way, then referrals gets a five for me. But um, yeah. Peter, anything you else? That's, want? that's why I gave it a five to me. I mean, my entire practice right now is referral based, you know, 80% yeah. of it. Yeah. And really what I mean by referrals is that if you do excellent work yeah. and you know, your clients get the results they want and they enjoy working with you, they're going to want to tell their friends. Right. And I see people getting in the way of that mm -hmm. by not asking right. or, or almost energetically blocking it. Mm -hmm. So All I'm saying here is, you know, when you do great work, it's, it's a huge service to your, you know, to your friend, to your former client, because they get to support you. Yeah. It's a service to you because you get more work and it's a service to the person who's struggling. Yeah. Nice. So these are, it's so easy to ask. And I don't like when people ask me repeatedly for referrals. Yeah. You know, I'm like, what, do you have some calendar event where every month you ask me again? Um, and I'd say the key to having referrals work is having a really clear niche as well. Yeah. If you're nice. just a life coach. It's hard to know who to refer, but if you help with a specific challenge, um, then people can easily think of referral, you know, referrals to send you. That's yeah. right. That's great. Um, okay. Webinars. Uh, I'll just, you know, chime in real quick is that I built my business really in the first three years from, from zero to a full-time business with doing webinars, partnering with other people. And that's the key. Why this is under categories of partnerships is obviously if you're starting out, you have no audience who are you going to do webinars for your friends and family might join, but as to support you. But when you reach out to other people who have audiences who genuinely need what something free you have to offer, you can start with free webinars. Mm -hmm. uh, it can, it's like number two to, to in person, in person speaking, number one, number two is webinars for building trust and credibility. Um, there's, we could talk so much more about this here, but let me turn it over. Tom, anything you want to say here? Yeah, I, I love webinars. The reason I gave it a four instead of a five is that uh, the, the whole um, you know, direction webinars are going now, they're all selling. And, yeah. and I'm fine with that. I, I think you should be selling. Don't get me wrong. You should be selling. You're in business. This is not nonprofit. It's not a hobby. Um, so never be apologetic about selling. But now they're all designed to sell and that's it. And, and so what that means is typically people aren't giving a lot of really good information. It's kind of, I, I don't know, it's not bait and switch necessarily. Um, but I, I think if someone can give really, really good engaging information that someone could walk away from and use, and then you have a pitch at the end, uh, I think that's perfectly fine. It can be very effective. It can be incredibly effective, especially with partnerships. Typically if you're doing it with a partnership, you're going to have to sell something. Otherwise they're not going to want to do the partnership. Right. But then you get into the sticky business of, you know, if you, if I sell it or, you know, promote to uh, my folks, uh, I'll do that if you promote to, to your folks. And right. you and I had the conversation about that. We know where that can, where that can yeah. lead. So just be real careful about uh, the motivation. So, yeah. yeah. I second that. I, the only reason I gave this a three is that just the added complexity of slides yeah. Yeah. is a lot for people to start with. Right. Um, so I think do webinar versus a teleclass only if there is a strong visual component to what mm -hmm. you're teaching. Yeah. If you can teach it just as well with audio only, 
um, I just think it's simpler for you and then people can more easily listen to it in the car, you know, right. download the audio file yeah. um, rather than sit in front of their computer or use a lot of data to watch a YouTube video. Yeah. True. So the, you know, techn technologically it seems a little more complex. Yeah. yeah. And you can even share a PDF and email it to someone. Um, if you, if you just want to do the teleclass too, which is to, to Peter's point, keep the technology as uh, easy as possible for getting started. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's, let's really quickly jump to maybe one of the foundational ones, uh, or maybe each, each of us can, can talk about one of these. Uh, I'll just start with market research. I feel like so many, ple so, I mean, I've, I've, I've coached hundreds of people over the last seven years. And the number one thing is if you are selling something that is in the buying behavior of society right now that people understand paying money for and want to buy. It is so much like you, you almost don't need to do most of these marketing methods. If you sell something people want, people are going to buy it. And so I'm just, you know, there's a couple of tools in here. Um, uh, and you know, there's a lot more we could talk about, but that's, that's, we all agree. <laughs> we all agree here on that one. Uh, does someone want to take um, split testing? Tom, how about you for split testing? Oh, me for split testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, split testing, I think you can uh, go down a rabbit hole real quick. Um, I, I actually saw someone that did uh, an article not long ago. He did, uh, he, he said, you know, the reason not to split test, he ran two different split tests, two different times a day, um, and he got such completely different results that he said it, it was completely ineffective and it threw him off completely. So his whole thing now is, you know, well, let's not waste time with this. It can, you can get some good data. You can split test headlines and see what people are clicking on and everything. But yeah. um, so I think that there's a place for it, but you've got to be really into the numbers. And I, I think everyone should be, but the reality is most people aren't. Um, yeah. Most people, if you say KPI, people don't even know what that means. Um, so mm -hmm. you've got to be willing to do this scientifically and have someone do it, I think, to really make it effective or else I think you can spend a lot of time worrying about your headline rather than just sending some stuff out there with really good information, not worrying so much about it at first. So I don't think that it's useless by any means, but I think it can be, you know, again, taking someone down a rabbit hole where they're going to spend a lot of time um, and maybe not see yeah. you know, real results right. initially. So that's cool. why I give it. Yeah. And I would agree for, for my, you know, solo business owners, it's just too advanced, too yeah. technical, you yeah. know, I, I prefer to just put a lot out there. And my, my sort of testing is how many people like it on Facebook. Yeah. That's right. the quickest, that is, that quickest, the test. cheapest testing you can do. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, and I'll say copywriting, yeah. um, really simply it's essential, right? If you yes. can't communicate about what you do in a way that, um, resonates with the hearts and minds of the people you're speaking to and, and want to, you know, sell something to, um, you're sunk. It doesn't matter what method you use. It, you just need to be relatable. And we could talk, all of us could talk for yeah. so long about what makes copywriting good. Yeah. I personally like it when it tells a story and it's authentic yeah. and it's nice. um, errors on the side of, of love and openness yeah. and the underlying message is you don't need me. You're awesome just as you are. And yeah. here's an incredible journey we could go on together. And here's something yeah. that I think would really be helpful for you. And, and so I think heavier on the, the benefits, lighter on the, you know, pain, shame and struggle. Yeah. And I think, I think a good way of ending is I would encourage everyone watching or listening to this to go to our websites and, and look at our copywriting because I think we each have different styles of it and everyone, everyone needs to find the style that matches them and their audience the best. Peter Rubin's website is peterrubincoaching.com. My website's georgecow.com and Tom is tombufordmarketing.com. One last thing I'll say is that we were just emailing before this and all three of us are under the weather and we decided to go ahead with this anyway. And then the, the lesson I want there is execution is more important than anything, than just knowledge. So it's like, even when we're sick, we're going to just go ahead and do this anyway. And uh, I really appreciate you guys showing up and, and doing this. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me guys. And thanks for anyone that's watching this. Uh, don't get discouraged by this long list of things. Find a couple things, you know, like copywriting. Yes, I agree. Copywriter. Find mm -hmm. someone that's a friend, a family member that can help you with copywriting. I think yeah. that it is a skill. Uh, like Peter said, you, you've got to learn copywriting at some point, but there's a, people that love to write copy. Uh, and as long as they can get your message, maybe you just talk, have it transcribed and give it to somebody. Um, and that, that can help have someone interview you. So there's a lot of ways of doing it, uh, but get out there and, and find the things that really resonate with you and, and just do it.
Awesome. One more, one more thing. If you made it to the end of this video, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. You're definitely committed. And I would um, encourage you to comment on this video yeah. and share one takeaway, one thing you learned, and what is one marketing method you want to explore more deeply? Nice. Because I mentioned this before, but I think we can get so distracted and the people I know who are successful at marketing pick one at a time and get really, really good at it. Excellent. Because what separates success from mediocrity is, is practice, practice, yeah. practice, practice. That's right. Awesome. Awesome so, guys. Thanks thank guys for doing this. Thanks everyone for watching. All right. Have fun. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.